All right. <clears throat> so Jin wrote this data model for the diet coach system relying on the ACS4 users table. Um, and he's got this first table here, food vendors. Uh, a vendor can be a brand like Campbell's or Fruity Olay. <clears throat> so I guess in this case, he just keeps track of the name and uh, gives us a primary key. Then he's got a table for foods. Um, so I guess he records a generated key for what food it is. Um, there may exist more than one entry for what might be considered the same food, taking into account different serving sizes. Um, McDonald's OJ versus Burger King OJ. Okay, uh, so this has a pretty name, uh, a generated ID like we said. Uh, it may have a food vendor that looks like it's optional because it's not constrained to be not null. Notice, notice that when he does vendor references food vendors, he doesn't say um, what data type it is because the uh, database is smart enough to know, okay, he's referencing the primary key of the food vendors table and its primary key is an integer called vendor ID. What do you guys think of this naming system here? Jin's got vendor, references food vendors. What do you think of that name for the column? I, I just think there's an asymmetry. I go too far towards regularity, but the table, I think the table should be called food vendors. Yeah. Well, my objection earlier, the food vendors whose vendor ID is, whose ID is vendor ID is, there's an asymmetry. I think food is important to talk about food vendors. So you're saying, well, that, 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 you're having a discussion now about this this yeah, column. Yeah, then. I guess that was a pending column. So you want this column to be called what? Uh, either ID because it's a primary key, and all tables should have primary key called ID, or food vendor ID because it's a singular thing. All right. Well, what about this one then? Then, by analogy, it would be food vendor. <coughs> what do you guys think? No opinions. Yeah, that kind of, this bottom me. this is a consistent Jin Choi bug, actually, that really irritates me. Because basically when you're writing code, um, you know, you constantly have to look at his data model to figure out, and you write different code depending on whether you're querying a food vendor from the food vendors table. You end up with uh, where constraints like where, you know, foods.vendor equals food underscore vendors dot vendor ID. And, you know, it just in practice turns out to be a lot of extra work. For the programmer. Yeah, I, like I said, I think so. I'm not sure if there's any reference book that you can cite. I can just say that in practice, I find it hard to program to Jin's data models for this reason. Um, standard serving size and record multiples of that size for the user's intake. I think this is interesting, okay. Um, right, so I guess if you had apples or something or cherries, you could have a standard serving size here of say 10 cherries or something. I'm not sure what the standard serving unit is. Calories per standard serving, fat grams, saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, protein, you know, percent alcohol. I think that's probably, I don't know if that, if you want to record somebody's alcohol consumption, this seems like a bad way to do it. I'm not sure how you do it, but I would think it would be like standard drinks equivalent or something, or ounces or, right? Because. Well, I think you have certain size and certain units. <coughs> right. So if you, you know, you have a pint of beer, serving the size of the corner. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay. So we're always assuming that an alcohol, that it's some kind of drink that we know how many al ounces it is and we take the percent alcohol off the, off the label. Okay. But here you generally don't know how much percent is alcohol is in beer. 
Is there, it's, it's illegal. Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. And why is it illegal? Because then you can compete on the and then, Yeah, and then they'll compete on how many. <laughs> they actually had a lawsuit against uh, this um, malt liquor, which is higher alcohol beer. It was named Power Master or something, and the government said that implies that it has more alcohol. So <clears throat> you're not even allowed to imply that it has extra alcohol. <laughs> You just pulled off a few characteristics of the food there, like the potassium and whatever. What's that? You just pulled off a few things like carbohydrates and phosphorus. And yeah. Alcohol. There's a lot more you could do. Yeah, I'm I'm assuming that Jin knows that, and he's, you know. He, he mentions it. He'll, on that comment. This table will be Oh, okay. Well, zone equivalents. No, no, no. But he's, I'm, I'm sure he's planning on vitamins and other credit in here. But That's a, like an important table. Yeah. Record of users' food intake. Okay, now we get into the um, the food intake record. Um, so here we have uh, inconsistency. User ID. Here he says what data type it is. It's not null references users. So it's inconsistent because now he's, instead of saying user, he says user ID. So this is the thing. You can never even rely on Jin saying vendor versus vendor ID. Uh, he doesn't need that. Does he need the not null? Or does he, he, doesn't he doesn't need the not null? What do you guys think? If you reference, you're referencing to a column which is not null. Yeah, if you have not, you don't reference. I don't think you can reference to a null column, or a column which can be null. Well, um, we saw the same thing up here, right? Vendor references food vendors. Right, it could be peanuts. Right. So what is it? So what, what in your mind would it mean for a vendor to be null? There wouldn't be a, a there wouldn't be a, a value in the, the vendor Okay, so I think a good way to look at it is that this table points to the food vendor's table. Mm -hmm. And if you just have a null value in the vendor column, you don't have a pointer. There's no pointer from that row sure. to a row in the food vendor's table. All right, now would that make sense? So let's say we took out the not null down here. What would we, what would we, what would we, we be recording in that case? If we had a row with a null column, yeah, that the food was eaten by the food was eaten by somebody whose ID we we don't know, which is uh, not really useful information. Someone stole it from Um. Okay, time recorded and date of consumption. That's an interesting. What do you guys think of those two column names? First of all, those of you who are anybody here using Postgres? Yeah. So what do you think of using date? Maybe you know. How does that sit with you? I'm not sure what you're getting at. If you want to store time, what do you think? How precise do you think this data type is? Yeah, so this is kind of misleadingly named an oracle. Um, that's precise down to a second, um, which often really screws up uh, programmers because you compare these two dates for equality and you find that they're never equal because they differ. You know, if you insert a bunch of rows into a database and you want to find the ones that are all on the same date, you compare them. But of course, if you insert them with a sysdate function, they're all going to have times precise down to the second, so they'll never be equal in general. Okay, so that's, it looks like Jin's got the right data type. Um, and uh, I'm kind of unhappy with the asymmetry in the column names. I don't know about you. But, you know, I would think it should be time recorded and time of consumption. Um, food, so here you get 
right? User underscore ID, but food is not food underscore ID. Servings consumed. Um, time of day consumed. Many different ways to represent when food was eaten. I guess that could be like, oh, here it is, morning, noon, afternoon, evening, night. So he's put in the check constraint. Uh, diet or info. Uh, sex. That should probably be called sex in the theory that the language, the English language may change back to the traditional <laughs> usage. Um, you don't want to have your, like, there's a lot of data models still in use that were defined 30 years ago when the language was different. So if you had the politically correct fashions of that time, it uh, might be confusing to people today. Um, birth date. I thought we had that in the data model. Maybe not in the ACS data model. Okay. I guess we probably did in ACS 3.4. Target weight. Integer number of kilograms. Not sure why that's restricted to integer, if you're a fanatic. <laughs> um, diet or weight log. So this is um, the weights that you've recorded. Um, so, all right, what do you guys think of this um, food intake table? What's missing from it? If I need to calculate how many calories a person has had today, how do I do it? Well, considering that, I, I assume that's the food table. Yeah. Is that a good idea or a bad idea to have to join? So we're, to get somebody's calorie consumption, we join this table to this table. Well, what's, all, what's the alternative to doing it that way? What's yeah, so you're proposing, I see you guys are both proposing the same thing, right? Which is to have uh, a calories column in this table, calculated at time of insertion, and stuff it in there. So that that's called denormalization, which is generally a bad idea to store derivable data. Okay, so what makes you guys think that might be a reasonable thing? You suggested it, so defend it. <laughs> Last refuge of the lame. It's more efficient, right? It's so you're saying uh, query efficiency. What's that? Yeah, it is the last refuge of the lame. On the other hand, if you have to do a 10-way join just to scratch your butt on the web, um, you're going to have a pretty slow site. So denormalization and storing derivable data may occasionally be a good idea for performance reasons. Um, I don't think that's a powerful argument here, though, because um, you know, adding a join uh, where you're looking at a primary key column isn't actually that slow. I think there's a more conceptual reason why it might be a good idea to denormalize. Anybody have a thought about that? It's certainly never going to change the calorie and the food item. You're not going to change it in the food table. Is that true? Well, you wouldn't want to. If someone well, yeah, if the vendor changes the serving. Yeah, look at the food table, right? <coughs> What if we're storing McDonald's Big Mac? You want to tell me the calorie count of a Big Mac will never change? So the idea is you want to normalize it because whenever you ate it, it's when it matters, right? Not so the calorie count. So you, are you arguing for or against denormalization? For. for denormalization. Yeah. Okay, you're saying because the calories of what you ate will never change, mm -hmm. but the calories of the Big Mac, will of the Big Mac in the foods table might change. Right. Yeah. But would there be a unique okay. record with the new ID? Well, that's a good question as to data modeling, whether you want to update the uh, Big Mac or whether you want to, um, you know, generate a new ID for, like, you know, Big Mac 2000. I don't know what the right answer is, but, it, you know, I think this, I hope this convinces you that um, it, uh, you know, the, the, the 
the, impl the powerful implications of making small, seemingly small data model changes. So basically, if you don't denormalize the calories, you will have to create new foods every time you uh, get updated information about calories. And if you do denormalize uh, and store that ostensibly derivable data, uh, then you can update your food records. Uh, personally, I w think I would um, I would denormalize. I would say, look, this is my best esti estimate at the time. I'm storing this log. Um, I actually would also want to play. So let's say the user's walking around with a Weight Watchers thing, um, or they're going to some weird restaurant. Let's suppose that restaurants get fancier. Maybe they have barcodes by the entrees, or they put it on their menus. <coughs> Um, why should I bother going through um, the menu system or whatever, uh, or in, in engaging in a long conversation with the diet coach, with Dr. Rachel, as we call her, uh, when I can say uh, 245 calories and just log that in there? What does it matter what I had? As long as if I know, if I happen to know what the calories are. So if we have a calories entry, then. Uh, you know, I don't have to create a new food item on the fly. I'm a Four Seasons Hotel, um, you know, room service menu item number three. I have to add this to the foods table. You know, when all I really want to do, I'm not going to be there again. I just want to log, you know, they happen to tell me how many calories it was. I mean, you actually see that on some menus, right? Especially in hotels, I think I've seen, like, diet conscious menu, and they say how many calories. Don't you need a lot more information about the diet or the stuff? I mean, health concerns, um, depends what you think you're building, you know. I think uh, as as I envision this, so Jin and I sort of built this for ourselves because we're both fat. Um, we figured, okay, there's all these chicks out there who read diet books and they can just look at something and tell you how many calories it is. Uh, and, you know, they know what to do, but they just don't have the willpower to do it always. So we said, look, we're not building a system for them because they know too much. And then there's people who are total fat slobs and don't care. Um, or maybe they're just naturally really thin, so they don't care. But there are these people in the middle, like us. You know, we don't have, we're not really that interested. We're not really that appearance conscious, <laughs> obviously. On the other hand, uh, so we don't want to bother going through, we don't want to bother having to learn anything. We're not really on a special diet. Um, you know, we just want a system that, you know, knows how much, how many calories are in McDonald's hamburger that will keep track of it for us and give us some coaching tips on the way. So it's it's being built for this, you know, medium group of users. So I think that the the, the stuff that you brought up, I, I guess th there's this philosophy in software engineering that it's almost always the second system built by a group of programmers that really sucks. Because, you know, in the second system, they try to embrace all possible features, all possible users. So you say, okay, now we're going to help the diabetics. I put in alcohol because I don't think I think gin drinks too much sometimes. So I said, okay, we want the system to be able to tell you that you know you're you're drinking too much. Um, but uh, I don't really drink at all. So anybody who has more than one drink is a lush in my in my book. <laughs> you need height for sure, in there. so you can compute that body mass index or whatever it is. That yeah, that's a good idea. So you definitely need height in here, and maybe like body type, ectomorph, endomorph, whatever. So it could be body mass index. Right, so a few things like that. But basically, uh, I think if you really wanted to make a good system for diabetics or something, it would have to be a different system um, because otherwise it would just get too complex to be built by the programming staff that we have, i.e. Jin. <laughs> you probably going to have to, when they in input the food prompt for the standard serving size, you know, give that info. Is there some way to get that back real quick? <clears throat> would some way to set up the data model to get it back fast? To get what, what back fast, the sorry? The standard serving size unit or size of unit, I guess. Because when you, you know, you have peas, like what's the standard standard uh, number of peas and stuff? In, when you are, are you talking about in the, well, <clears throat> remember, this, this table is going to be built by the publisher, mm -hmm. right? In general, this table is going to be populated by um, the people operating the service. So the user never has to populate this table. Right. But you have to probably prompt the user when he enters the data. Yeah. So what that information is. Right? So what are you what are you saying? Is there some way to get it out really fast? I mean, should, you, should you handle it differently than all the other stuff? You don't have get to it out of Oracle really fast. Yeah. I guess. I mean, when you're doing a query against an index table using the primary key, so that's, that's as fast as it's ever going to get. Um, the only thing faster you can do is 
Um, you could keep a hash table uh, in AOL server in RAM. Um, I don't know if there's a way to do that in IIS. Probably there is. I mean, IIS is a single running C program, so it can allocate extra data structures and keep them around persistently. And so you could, you know, when you have a really serious performance problem, you pull stuff from the database once, you keep it in a web server's memory, and then, you know, you can access that with an in-memory hash table lookup or something. So that is quite a bit fat. You know, that can be you, a thousand times faster than going and sending a SQL query all over the network to the database. Um, it's hard to do with, uh, if you have a more primitive, older style web server with one process per user like Apache, it becomes hard to do. Although you can still do it, you just end up, if you have 80 simultaneous users, you have 80 copies of Apache, you have 80 copies of your uh, cache data. So you end up with a, you know, you end up needing a computer with 80 times as much RAM. <laughs> so I don't recommend that for um, Apache users, but for uh, Microsoft IIS or AOL servers, say. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. So, so if you're going to record a meal, you would say. But I, I never do that. So the things that we do at ours in our digital community system historically, um, things that you sort of need to operate the service, like we end up caching in memory things like which file on the file system should you serve in response to a particular abstract URL, because that's essentially part of what the web server is doing, and you only want to do that, you know, once and maybe to keep it that cache for an hour. Um, you cache uh, things like maybe uh, whether there's a help text available on the file system for a particular page, um, stuff that has to do with the mechanics. But in the, actual, the actual data, generally, um, we almost always go back to Oracle. That way that the site is, the objective is to have a site that's uh, never slower than some script executing doing some database queries. <clears throat> and if you have towers of abstraction, in the mechanics of how you programmed it to have those um, cached in RAM and, uh, you know, al already done by the time you're going to serve, you know, a second or a third page to the user. But this is, this is certainly not one of those things that I'd pull out, particularly since there may be a huge number of food items. And, you know, that this is what the database is supposed to be good at, keeping a whole bunch of data and giving you back the pieces that you want quickly. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. You can ask Jin. Um, it does seem like a bad idea to have uh, so many not nulls. Those, those might be the FDA regulations now on labeling the food that you have to have something there, so it's easy to get. I, I don't know. Uh, it may be easy to get, but it'd be better to have nulls, particularly since SQL is smart about if you want to average. Um, you know, all the uh, aggregation functions are smart about ignoring nulls. Uh, whereas if you uh, put them in the null constraints, people will probably have to type zeros a lot, which will screw up things like averages. All right. So I think we've beaten this one to death, unless anybody has any more high-level comments about whether this can work or not. Um, I guess so, although you could, I think that is derivable data from this table. You could just look at, uh, you know, select uh, weight from diet or weight log, um, where weigh date equals, and then an open paren, subquery, select minimum. That's actually not a great way to do things, unfortunately, because you could, this is precise to the second. And therefore, um, it is potent, but it is potentially the case that a user could weigh himself. Let's say I have a machine that is weighing the user. So the machine could be pumping in three weights in the same second. So you then end up getting three columns back <coughs> from that query because where weigh date equals the minimum weigh date in the table would actually return three rows because they'd all have the same weigh date. Like I said, if, if, if date weren't precise to the second, this would be a, that would be a terrible way to do things because you'd be very likely to have a couple weighings in the morning and in the evening. Uh, in the case of Oracle, because um, the date is precise to the second, you're unlikely to have more than two uh, rows at precisely the, the minimum, but it's possible, so you end up with a really subtle bug. And uh, so the correct way to do that actually is if you're inside the database, you do it with something like called cursors. 
So you basically open a cursor into this table where you've selected uh, from diet or weight log, um, order by weigh date, and then you pull the first row out, and then you close off the cursor. And you can do the same thing from AOL server. Uh, you do, uh, well, I don't know, with the, with the AOL, with the ACS API, well, with the AOL server raw API, you do NSDB select, which sets up the cursor. Then you do an NSDB get row, which will pull one row off the top. And then you do an NSDB flush to close the cursor, and you're done. And that actually can be quite fast. It looks like a really inefficient query because, you know, you're potentially specifying, hey, give me back a million rows. But actually, databases are quite smart about doing this, and they don't do any unnecessary work um, until they, they, they do the work uh, on a one row at a time basis as you fetch it. So it's perfectly efficient to, uh, uh, we, we did this on the scorecard site, actually, the live public site for zip codes. Oh, not on the scorecard, on the action network where we match people up. Yeah, we, we, we often specify queries that return um, millions of rows of nine digit zip codes, and then we just ask for the first one. So, and it's quite fast. And and, oh, but it's only fast if you have an index on that column, right? Because if, if you say, give me this whole table, order by, you know, this particular field, then the day, and then you only want one row, the first thing the database has to do is sort the whole thing. So that's going to take quite a long time. And as you see, this is not indexed. So actually, you got a good point there. If you're going to do it that way, you should build an index on uh, user ID, comma, way date, which would make the query instant. I'm sorry if you considered putting in Conversion information for, for different metrics. Because I notice that the, the, the unit of food is not referenced in any of the tables. So sometimes it's going to be you know OZ period. Sometimes it's going to be ounces spelled out. Um, and if your user has some potato chips and the doctor asks how many ounces, you know, your user says a lot of other bags, so you know, five point. So you're saying the standard serving unit, for example, could be. We reference this <coughs> to another uh -huh. table. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't know. We'll have to ask Jim what he was thinking. Although I think uh, it looks like that's not really going to be used, right? It looks like he's got a serving size model, a calories per serving, and that's fundamentally what's going to be driving this thing. Yeah, but if the user sort of, you know, I mean, what is a, what is a serving, right? You're saying a serving is eight ounces. Uh, you know, but if the user doesn't know how many ounces yeah. she, she had, Right. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, like, how does the user do this if they have, like, some chicken dish and some very high creamy sauce? How do you answer that kind of thing? I don't know. It's a good question. Well, first of all, Jin's really, you know, he's targeting the fast food market. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, <laughs> we do have to put different UIs on this. I have a feeling that we'll probably have to look at, say, Weight Watchers, and see how they deal with something like that. Um, you know, presumably it would you know go down to three meat units, one cream unit, one vegetable unit. You teach them about the system of the units. Yeah. So we'll have to do some experiment about you know what is the lightest weight thing you can teach people that will let them use the system. And if people only eat at fast food restaurants, that will be in golden shape because <laughs> those menus are simple and easy to represent. A graphical interface where they sketch how long they're serving once. <laughs> <laughs> density to the, to the All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, software structure since now you're, I hope, moving from user registration into your full community system. So fundamentally, what are you guys building in your data model? I think, maybe I'll use this blackboard over here so it's closer to everybody. All right, you've got uh, a user DB. And you've certainly got to have a content DB. So these are conceptual things. You're probably going to represent these 
in uh, just tables, all in the same table space, all owned by the same user in your relational database management system. So, you know, when it says database, don't start imagining you're going to have separate physical computers or anything because that's going to make joining and other operations quite slow and painful. Um, so here you have to record, you know, who's a user. Um, and uh, here you've got to record, um, I don't know, here's a comment, here's an article, here's a bulletin board uh, question. So you need a uh, user content map. And here you're going to have to store um, who's contributed which of these content items. Um, you need that information so that you can implement some of the online community ideas we showed earlier, like accountability. You need to know, you know what a particular person has said on a site, and also you know, if something has been said, who said it. You also need to know which users have read which pieces of content. Uh, and you might say, well, why do I need to know that? Well, consider the Sloan School at MIT that's running this um, system to coordinate all uh, assignments, students, TAs, and so forth. Uh, the professors upload the homework assignments and handouts uh, to the server and the students download them. If you don't record who's read what, you can't offer the, uh, you can't build a service that goes and sweeps the database at 4.30 on Friday and sends email to a student saying, you know, got four assignments due on Monday and we notice you've only downloaded two of them, uh, so you probably shouldn't go to a party tonight um, when you could be uh, working on your homework. So I think you want both that, both uh, that kind of information. You may also want to, if you want to personalize, you may want to store in here, um, you know, what articles the user has liked. So that's another reason to store what they've read. You keep track of stuff that they read and liked, stuff that they read and didn't like, and then when there's a new piece of content that uh, it gets added to the service, if you're willing to do some grinding away with full text search engines and uh, com you know comparing text similarities you can probably come up with a good guess as to whether the user would, that particular user would like this particular new piece of content. Okay. Um, I believe that you also need a user to user map area. Okay. So what does this, con what does this consist of? Well, some stuff that you've already built, perhaps, like the user grouping tables. Um, that falls in here, which users are aggregated into certain groups. I think also we talked um, earlier this course about implementing an interesting person system on Photo.net. We're in a big community. You could mark uh, another user as interesting to you and that you wanted to watch for new content posted by that person, whether it be photographs or writing. That again falls under the rubric of user user map. This is somebody I like, this is somebody I don't like. Bozo filters on Usenet. I never want to see any posting by this person anymore. So you get a personalized view where if there's some flamer you don't like, you never see anything by that user again. Um, okay, so you've got to build all of these things. Um, you saw, I think, on Monday how the RS Digital Community System 4.0 unifies all tables, essentially, in a big class hierarchy. Basically. Um, it, it's built the way you would have built 20 years ago. You would have built the system if you had if you were using commonless object system 20 years ago, and you were a commonless programmer. That's the sort of thing you would build. And if you were using Java all by itself, that's the kind of thing you would build, where you had a base class with all the variables you wanted for everything on your system, like when they were added, when they were modified, um, where you had you know a more specialized class for a user. A more specialized, or for a person with name and so forth, a more specialized class, subclass for a user that inherited from person. Um, and you build those hierarchies that way. And then the same tree would also con contain, you know, an article or a B board posting or whatever. So that's all fine and dandy. Um, you know, the problem with those uh, systems is that the mechanisms for making those objects persistent have never been very efficient. So basically, object databases really never caught on very well and never worked very well as a practical matter. So the ACS3, for example, is a representation of a move you know, diametrically opposed to that. 
and said, okay, we're going to have a user's table, and it's going to share nothing with the B-board table. And we're going to have a news table uh, for, you know, photo.net slash news. Uh, and that's going to have, you know, news items, and that's going to be totally separate from the B-board table. And we're going to have a static content table for articles, and that's totally separate from the other two. So you get all these little standalone island tables, which is very efficient from uh, the database's point of view. Again, if you want to grab one news article or one B-board posting, you just have to look in one table, no joins. You get a blazingly fast system, which is one reason that, you know, Photo.net, which runs ACS3, can serve millions of hits per day, each one personalized with, uh, you know, just four processors running the Oracle database, running the web server, doing everything. Um, whereas, uh, you know, very complex, multi-layered system, particularly when implemented on top of a relational database management system that really isn't designed to handle that, uh, could get quite pokey. Um, Oracle is pretty good, actually. If you had to, if you had to pick a database where you're going to do a six or an eight-way join on every query, uh, Oracle is definitely the system to have um, compared to something like Postgres and even SQL Server probably starts to slow down. Uh, so the stuff that you saw in ACS, where you have, you know the fundamental objects table, and then you have a helper table for every subclass storing the extra columns associated. That basically means if you're going to query out an object of uh, type, say, user, or an object of uh, type, you know, B-board posting, you're going to be querying, you're going to be joining four tables. Um, and uh, that is going to, like I said, slow you down. But the performance hit is probably least in something like Oracle. So what am I proposing for? Um, I should tell you, so there's a couple things. For the Postgres guys, the good news is that there actually is a lot of at least syntactic support. I'm not sure how it's implemented under the hood. It may be fast, it may be slow. But Postgres is the pioneering uh, relational database that supports this kind of class hierarchy um, in directly in the table system. So in Postgres, you can say, I'm going to create a table called you know, my objects or something. And that's going to have, uh, you know, an object ID and, um, I don't know, some create, create and date. Yeah. Not very good. Okay, whatever, a few more columns. And then you're going to say, well, I want to create um, a, a table called person that inherits from this. And basically, it sort of conceptually sticks on the person columns, actually not for every row in the table, just for some. So we'll tack on for some of the rows in this table. Uh, you know, first name, last name, I don't know, whatever else you want for a person. Okay, and then you can create a user table. Maybe there's a couple things like that are specific to users, like when you were authorized and whether you're banned or not. And for the things that happen to be users, extra rows get tacked on there. So if you query from the users table, you get two rows um, with a whole bunch of columns. If you query from the persons table, you get uh, four rows uh, with somewhat fewer columns. If you query from the objects table, you get a lot of rows, but not too many columns. There's also a way to get ragged rows back. You can say query from the objects, my objects table, uh, but show me everything, uh, including all the subclasses. So then you get this. It's called a, you know, it's, it looks sort of ragged as you might expect because you're getting, um, you know, different numbers of columns with uh, each row that you get back. Uh, now, of course, if you look at other specialized and specializations with other subclasses, you're going to see equivalent um, things here, like you know, content item, um, and all inheriting back to the my objects table. So. I don't know how Postgres really works under the hood. What it may be doing is creating a separate table for persons and creating a separate helper table for users and then just joining it behind your back using their standard join mechanism. That would be a perfectly legal way for it to do it. I haven't pawed through the C code, but I'm assuming they have some kind of specialization uh, that might make it a little more efficient than with, uh, say, Oracle. If you want to do this kind of thing with Oracle, you know, you have to create these three tables uh, you can create some of, without extra machinery, which they do have in ACS, it's going to be hard to get that ragged report that I just mentioned. But it's not hard to query from users from a table that you call users and get 
your what you'd expect back because you can create views. So you create a view called maybe your your actual table where the data are stored is called user underscore users underscore helper. And then you, but the users table is actually a view that joins um, three tables underneath. So as far as your programming goes, um, you're not uh, really working much slower. But again, um, you know, if you have a complicated class hierarchy, the performance hit to using a relational database over an object database is, is just enormous. Um, the advantage of using a relational database is it does have better support for transactions, for concurrency. You're much more likely to be able to interface with other corporate data sources and things that people have already developed. Um, so I'm kind of of two minds. Um, and as we discussed earlier, in an earlier lecture, there's things like Java 2 Enterprise Edition that say, okay, you can just live in a world of Java objects and then we'll do all the SQL stuff behind your back and you know, God knows how efficient it's going to be, but at least you won't have to think uh, about SQL. You can only think of it in terms of this natural class hierarchy. So this is a powerful way to write code. Um, but having direct SQL access to your data model is also, can also be quite powerful because SQL is a really interesting declarative query language. Um, generally, when you have, uh, if you're just living in the world of Java objects, you're saying that the only queries will be done by professional programmers. They will only be done with, you know, loops in Java and things. So actually, um, not having any idea how your data are stored in SQL may not be such a good thing because it may preclude you from going into SQL Plus and asking some interesting questions and getting some interesting results. All right, so what am I proposing for, uh, what would I recommend that you do uh, in this course? Well, I don't think going the whole hog ACS approach really makes much sense um, because one reason that the ACS approach is good is for permissionings and workflow, which you're not really going to be working on. You're going to be hard coding a lot of that. Um, again, if you're not building a, if you're building a standard product that you know you want thousands and thousands of websites to use, you have to make it very flexible. If you're building one site, you know, for the fire code people, you know, they can just tell you, okay, um, you know, any user can add. Uh, code members only can do the following three things, and you can just hard code that into your scripts, and it's a lot easier than producing the mother of all data models. Um, on the other hand. I don't think going the ACS, I don't recommend the ACS3 style of approach. Uh, I think that the reason we end up with so many separate tables is we accre accreted applications over the years. So I took three days out and I wrote the B board initially. And I took another three days out and I wrote the classified ad system. And I took another uh, you know, day out and wrote the news system. And I took another day out, you know, it was just easier to do separate tables and I wasn't, this happened over a period of years and I just didn't notice the similarity. Um, as I was doing it. So there's no reason to think that that's the right way to do things. I think that you actually can get by pretty much with um, one table for all your content. I actually think that uh, for this site, you might end up with some null columns, um, but you probably could say, well, an article and a comment only differ in that the comment refers to an article, right? So there's this refers to idea and uh, it makes sense for a comment on an article, but not for an article. So an article is anything with a null refers to. Um, as far as, uh, say, a bulletin board posting goes, um, there's a few tricks which are described in my old book having to do with, I think it might even be my old, old book, uh, having to do with keeping a message uh, ID key that's sortable lexicographically, so denormalizing out the threading at insertion time and figuring out what key can we produce that if we just do a SQL order by will result in the correct uh, threaded sort order and therefore really efficient display of a B board. Again, that's something that uh, you could probably put in to uh, a column and if it's uh, null, that means it's not a bulletin board. It's not part of any B board. They also had this idea, it probably should be called parent ID they had this idea in, the other things that are interesting about B boards is uh, they belong to a topic and they have a category. So there again, right in, in photo.net, for example,
the topic would be something like nature photography. And category would be something like equipment. The category, that might actually be a, sort of a primary category column, might be sort of a useful thing anyway, for even for articles. So you could have a, I actually think it would have been nicer on photo.net in a way to have a single site-wide canonical list of categories. Wouldn't necessarily work so well for these disparate uh, B boards, but you know, it'd be nice to know, you know, for every article on the system, does it relate to uh, nature photography? Does it relate to large format? Of course, you end up, we do actually have a mechanism in ACS3 for storing multiple rows for that. Uh, so you can, you know, ma you can map any piece of content into, you know, one or more categories and say how strong the mapping is. But anyway, what I'm saying is that these things aren't actually that different. I think you could get it all into one table um, and accomplish everything you need. And of course, remember, you can alter tables as you, as you need to. And I don't think there's anything really wrong with having a lot of null columns. So basically, uh, if it's an article, it's going to have all the B-board-like columns are going to be null. And uh, if it's a B-board posting, maybe some of the comment related things will be no. Uh, over here, I believe that it's probably, I, you could implement a, that ACS style party system, but I believe that that's probably more trouble than it's worth. And then if you just have users and user groups, you'll be reasonably happy and um, um, you know, you'll have a little bit of ugliness in your code, but at least people will be able to read it. That's one thing that sucks about ACS 4.0 is that I think it becomes almost impossible to understand. There's enough abstraction. The abstraction adds power. And if you spend a few you know, weeks really learning everything and immersed in it, you know, maybe you can uh, do bigger changes with fewer lines of code. But uh, one advantage of ACS3 was that if you understood Oracle uh, or SQL in general, you could see completely what the system was doing. You could basically read any script and then say, aha, I know what this thing does. Whereas when um, you get very abstract and complex, you know, you have to have a lot of extra knowledge and read a lot of extra docs. So again, if you have a query from the user groups table, you don't really need to know a lot about the system design to know what's happening. If it's a querying, you know, user, show me the user where ID number <laughs> equals number 37. Well, again, you know exactly what's happening um, just by reading the SQL. So. Uh, so, I, but, so I do recommend, like I said, trying to unify everything in content. Uh, I recommend um, uh, storing what the users read as well as what the users contributed. Um, I recommend keeping users and user groups in separate tables, uh, as you've probably been doing. Um, so that's data model, which I want to have a meeting with each group. It's too bad nobody's here. I guess you'll have to spread the word. But on Sunday, I want to have a meeting with each. I'm going to spend the whole day here, I guess, starting at around noon. And maybe somebody can, the TAs aren't even here. Maybe the TAs will organize a, what? Sunday's Easter. Easter. Oh. Is that bad? Nobody's going to be <laughs> Are people going to be here or not? No. I guess it'll be short. <laughs> we'll see who wants to sign up. I can, sh I can show up. Um, and um, okay, so that's the data model. There's a separate issue of software modularity, which I just want to talk about a little bit. It's worth designing um, a couple simple mechanisms, I believe, for modules to talk to each other. So you have to ask yourself, you know, if I'm building a B-board system. What should it offer to the other modules in the system? So basically, you have to think of, you know, sort of an administration area, and then probably, I don't know, at least a user accountability area. They both want sort of the same things. Um, for the Remember we talked about one principle of online community, meaning you had to make it very simple and fast for one person to administer the whole thing? That's never going to be possible if you have to go into 17 different admin areas to see what's new and whether any of it is problematic. So that means that the administration interface 
has to be able to have a way, here's all the modules in the system, content modules, of querying each module in turn and asking what's new. So the way that we did this with ACS 3.4 is when any new module was loaded at startup, um, it would have some you know, uh, private tickle library functions that were started up. It would push onto a list. Here I am. Here's my name. I'm this new module. Here's a procedure that you can call to get my um, new content. So then the administration interface, that what's new page, it doesn't have hard, you saw all those different things on the photo.net. Let me show you that page. Um, it has stuff from every category. You're going to see classifieds, photo DB. This page isn't hard coded to know about each module in the system. All this page is doing is calling, it's looping through a list of modules. So it's looping into the chat area, calling a procedure, and the chat thing is giving back um, a, uh, I think it gives back a list, a tickle list of items, and then these are being rendered in this user interface. And basically, you can ask for new stuff. You can say, show me the new stuff for the administrator, in which case you get back stuff that includes links to edit and delete moderation stuff. Or you can say, show me the new stuff. Uh, I believe there is, I forget where it is, unfortunately. Shared. Hey. Um, anyway, there's a user visible one that does the same basic thing but leaves out some of the irrelevant stuff. Huh, pretty sad. I've forgotten where it is. <laughs> anyway, it's there. There are pages where you can see all the new stuff on the site from a user's point of view. So you want to have some way that, that this page doesn't have to be hand-coded because if you do that, then... It's a pretty ugly system design. If somebody adds a new module, they have to go edit a bunch of other pages on the system. So I think it is nice if you have uh, a well-defined API from your, mo from your sort of user-level modules to your administration interface and also to over here. Um, so like I said, you should be able to ask what's new. In ACS 3x, 3.x, you can say, show me what's new for a user to display in HTML. Show me what's new for an administrator to display in HTML, and that includes the admin links. And you can say, show me what's new for a user for an email summary. So then you can offer users the ability to sign up for an email subscription of all new content on the site. Um, okay. For user accountability, you want to do the same thing, but you want to say, um, you want to ask the question, what did user number 37 contribute? What, do you, what have you got from user 2037 in your um, module? And in this case, you probably don't need a special admin version that has admin links. Maybe you do. But uh, you certainly want um, to come back with a summary. It does need to be HTML, basically. You want to come back with a summary of you know, what the user's done, um, usually one line per contribution that hyperclicks to the correct place in the system where they can see the uh, full contribution. And that may vary. You know, so for example, for B-board postings, we show the subject line of what the user typed, but if they click on it, we actually go to the parent uh, question. Um, you know, if it's a response to a question, we don't show just the user's answer. We actually hyperlink to the entire question and answer session and then let the uh, meetware, as we say, uh, scroll through and find the uh, user's question in context. We probably should, if we were nice, we would have a special mode where, you know, one particular contribution was highlighted in red out of the whole exchange, but I never got that fancy with programming. Probably should. All right, so modularity in your software. So it's worth coming up with a data model and coming up with a theory about how your modules are going to talk to. So this is effectively 
the next problem set. I was going to make it, like I said, due on Sunday and reviewable then. Um, maybe we can try reviewing some of it late Monday night or something. Um, if, you, if you have a system where you have one content database, mm -hmm. does that then begin to change how this works? Because I can then do one query to find out what the user has done. It's a good question, and that's what they tried to do in ACS 4.0, because the people who wrote it weren't, you know, they had no experience actually operating web service, so they thought that would be okay. But it turns out not to be okay. Um, some of the stuff you can automatically specify. You actually could have helper tables, although I don't think they do, that say for this particular object type, here's how you build up a summary of it. Here's how you build up an administrative link to it and then combine those somehow. Um, but the problem is that there's spe there may be specialized knowledge. The example I just gave for Bboard, for example, that when you're summarizing a user's Bboard contributions, you give the subject line, but you don't actually link to a page showing the full uh, body of what they wrote. Instead, you link to the entire thread. So that's the kind of thing that is hard to just you know blindly query into the content DB and say, okay, I found all the things these user wrote by subject. Okay, and then if you click, I'll give you the full body of what they wrote because you know it's not presenting it in context. You could uh, you could instead of what's new, you could say format this. Each module could. Yeah, I think I, I think you could build something. Yeah, if 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 if, if you thought about it like that. Um, although again, remember um, in the content database, you may not know which module it came from. All you're going to really know is what um, object ID it is, or what oh, and what object type it is. So, for example, you might have four. It's conceivable you could build four user modules that were for completely different purposes. They were all able to use um, a content, um, an object type of article. Okay, at which point you're presenting them all in the same way. You're presenting them mixed together. Maybe they're sorted by date. Um, and it might actually be much more effective. And let's say you have sections on, um, you know, putting fires out and starting fires. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, if the user has contributed three articles to each of those sections, um, if you do it your way, um, or which is also the ACS4 way, they're going to be printed out just totally miscellaneously in the order that they were uh, contributed. Whereas if you do it this way, organized around the um, modules of the site, if those indeed are separate uh, modules, then you'll see them grouped by sort of conceptually where they are on the site. I don't think it's you know worth getting into religious war about, but um, like I said, I think if if you don't have either the if you don't if you don't go all the way with the content database query and also keep either information around about how to administer that stuff or you know query the module back how to how do I present this now for administration, then you lose a lot of the features of online community that we talked about earlier. So whatever you do, make sure that you can produce a page like this. And like I said, that user's contributions page that I can't find, or the new stuff page for the users as well. All right, any questions? So maybe we'll make this due on Monday. I'll try to come by on Monday. Um, I can't you know, like spend the whole day here on Monday like I could on Sunday. Is what's due written up some? No, sadly. Just a data model, SQL data model, and then some kind of um, theory about how you're going to do this module, inter this uh, interaction among the modules. No questions? A little question. What specified in the URL is only for new users? So this is, this is not technically what's new, but what did the new users? You could expand it to all users if you wanted to. So it's all the stuff the new users did, and it, it's all the new stuff from new users, yeah. as it happens. I happen to be interested in that for administration. But and, and could there be um, uh, new groups, uh, new content? <coughs> is there a level of abstraction where there is new content related yeah, I mean, links? Um, the, the query on the URL being only from new groups or only from new content. 
Sure, anything you want. I mean, as it happens, you know, on Photo.net, the new users have proven to be the problematic ones. On your sites, I don't recommend even going this far. I mean, probably just show all new stuff because you're not going to have that many users and not that much content. So why make your life more complicated? What happens when you hit the edit button underneath one of their comments? I mean, do, you, do you actually go in and change what people have written? Damn straight. What guidelines do you use for them? No, not much. Let's see. Let's edit this guy. <laughs> wow, that's pretty slow. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> no, we de we generally don't. We generally edit for uh, if it's a typo or something, but we we wouldn't. Uh, I I I do feel tempted sometimes if somebody says some useful stuff that's really, you know, they're supposed to use the com comment server for alternative perspectives. So if they say I love this review, you know. And here's why, and then a new paragraph. I have an icon FM3 also, and here's how I use it. I often feel tempted to delete out the review of the article, um, you know, good or bad, uh, because it's irrelevant to the other users and it would shorten up the page. But again, you know, we the site hasn't been careful, sufficiently carefully edited that it seems worth it, except in a few cases like the Nikon D1 article. <laughs> I think Rajiv, Rajiv and Lisa, they, they went medieval on that. They deleted all, all, a lot of those flamer losers altogether. 